Amen. We're at Children's Church today, right? Yeah. So kids, you can be dismissed at Children's Church at this point. Head with your teachers, your leaders, follow them. And uh, with your, you're welcome to stay up here as well. If you have permission there from your parents or whoever brought you, go ahead and head to that. Well, we've been going through the book of Romans for a few weeks now, and we're, so I want to invite you to turn with me to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, many of you maybe were led to the Lord uh, that know Christ is your Savior through an explanation of the gospel uh, that many people call the Romans Road, and that's walking through the book of Romans, some passages pointing us to saving faith in Christ. Well, what I want to do this morning is stay in Romans, because that's where we've been, and share with you a message I'm calling the Romans Road to the Resurrection. In a sense, what we're going to do here is we're going to trace the theme of the resurrection throughout the book of Romans. And uh, there are seven or eight particular two words that are used, and they're used in a couple different ways in Romans. I'm going to put those in little, some themes to bring about a point. So this is um, kind of like a biblical theology of the resurrection in Romans. So we often go verse by verse, or a topic, which is verse with verse. But when you do a, a biblical theology, it's verse through verse. And so we're going to do that this morning as we look at the Romans road. Of, to the resurrection and before we do that um, let's have a word of prayer and ask God to speak to our hearts Father I just want to pray and declare one more time that I need you Lord I confess that um, uh, there are this is life and death matter that we're dealing with and so Lord I can want to crucify my flesh and uh Confess the temptation and sin to want to um, impress or um, for people to like me or, or like the message. Uh, Lord, I confess that, uh, that it doesn't matter, that it is not the servant but the word. So, Lord, I pray that you'd take the pages, the words of Scripture, and use them as the Spirit's sword now. Uh, it is what will bring life and give faith. Lord, there are so many, there are hundreds of needs and soul needs in this room right now. And I pray that you'd use your word to, to minister to them. Uh, and we know the Holy Spirit's here. We expect him and we believe in the Holy Spirit to do his work. So we thank him. Lord, we want to glorify you in this time. Give us ears to hear what your spirit would say to your church. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, back in 2007, uh, the Discovery Channel had an episode called The Lost Tomb of Jesus. And it was a documentary in which they found a limestone, supposedly found a limestone box or an ossuary, a box that would hold the remains. And on it was the name Jesus, son of Joseph. It was a Canadian documentary film. Uh, the um, executive producer of that was James Cameron, who you'll recognize from Titanic. And um, as one author said, it's amazing how evidence falls into place when you begin with the conclusion and a hammer. <laughs> if you have your a, a conclusion in mind and a hammer, this is the same guy who supposedly found the nails that hung Jesus on the cross in the spring of 2011. And, uh, and then almost every year, there's another something like this that comes out. In 2017, CNN had a, uh, a, a special scheduled on this, uh, shining new light on the historical Jesus with the nails and things like that. So what do you do with that? Do you believe in the resurrection? And the Bible would put it that way. It's a bodily resurrection. Uh, it, it, maybe before or other times, I don't have time to go in here, but there's a lot of studies and statistics that come about that people that will say, well, and there's people that will stand behind wooden desks like this today and will say, it doesn't really matter if you believe it's bodily, you know, it could be spiritual or he lives in my heart or it was a good example or it was whatever. And you um, can't get that from the Bible. Um, and um, so it really comes down to is it true or it's not true. Um, Tim Keller said it this way. He said, if Jesus rose from the dead, you have to accept all that he said. 
If he didn't rise from the dead, why worry about anything that he said? If Jesus rose from the dead, it changes everything. Without the resurrection, there's no good news. John Stott said it this way. He said, Christianity is in its very essence a resurrection religion. The concept of resurrection lies at the heart. If you remove it, Christianity is destroyed. It's laughed at. It's, it's silly. So the next text that we're in is in um, verses 16 and 17, which is really the theme. So in a couple of weeks, we're going to get to that. And one of the things I wanted to share with you when we do that is I'm going to show you some graffiti from the first or maybe second century. There's, there's this graffiti that they found on the walls of this cave of these folks making fun of a guy named Aleximanos. And they're holding up what is a man on a cross, and the head of the man is drawn to be a donkey. And the caption reads, Aleximanos worships his God. And it's obviously a mockery of this idea of people worshiping someone who would have been killed. It would be shameful In the Greco-Roman life, of which the New Testament is birth, the New Testament church is birthed, is this idea of life after death, this concept of physically embodied existence after death, that was something only for fables, something to be laughed at, not by the educated. Not much has changed, right? So I pose two questions to you this morning. Why is the resurrection important, and what does it mean for you if it does? These are some of the most important questions you'll ever answer. And for all of us, the occasion of did Jesus rise from the dead, and what are the implications of that resurrection, show everything about us. This is, this is, this is a huge deal. So um, there's also, this is a need for Christians to focus on this, because have you ever noticed that Christians tend to talk more about the death of Jesus than they do, and the, the events of Good Friday than they do the events of Resurrection Sunday. And this message is an anecdote to that, uh, is an antidote to that. The gospel is not just about dealing with the death of Jesus, but from the beginning to the end of the gospel, the resurrection is involved. So we're going to trace that theme. And the first point I want you to see is something we already saw a few weeks ago in Romans, is that the gospel is about the risen Christ, that the gospel is the resurrection, first point, is, is a crucial part of the gospel. I want you to see this in chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, where it says here for us that concerning, he's speaking, Paul, talking about this concern, this, how he separated to the gospel, set apart to the gospel, verse 2, verse 3, concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the Son of God in power to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. He's given a summary statement of the gospel. You see the same thing when he writes in 1 Corinthians, the classic statement of what is the gospel, that Jesus died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried and he rose again the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. This is, the resurrection is a crucial part of the gospel. The resurrection is a crucial component of it. Um, is a, the, the, the three circles uh, witnessing tool that our young adults went through a year or so ago, uh, Jimmy Scroggins, who's a pastor down in Florida, um, he was on a missions trip with a missionary to the Philippines named Bob, Bob Tebow. You might recognize his son named Tim. Um, and so Bob Tebow, and Jimmy was a seminary student at the time, and he got to preach, and, and he preached the gospel, and he did his best, and he was all theologically precise because he was, you know, uh, a seminary student at the time. And he got done, and he was kind of an expecting a nice attaboy, right? And uh, when they got in the room that night, Bob said, Hey, you did a great job. Your heart was in it. I could tell you were passionate, but you failed to preach the gospel. He's like, what? I talked about how Jesus died for our sins. He's like, yeah, but you didn't get to the other part, that he rose. Then that's part of the gospel. If you, if you don't put the resurrection in, you haven't preached the gospel. That is part, it is a crucial part of the gospel. The, the, the irrefutable facts of the life, death, and burial of, of Jesus is the gospel. So, his this function in his in his humanity it says that he was descended from david according to the flesh this is his humanity his humiliation but then he is exalted and his exaltation of christ starts at the resurrection 
The resurrection, this transition from weakness to glory, declared to be the Son of God. Doesn't mean that the resurrection made him to be the Son of God. It declared, it showed that specialness there. John Broadus, who was a preacher about over a century ago, he said it this way, it was the signal manual of the deity. It was the seal of the sovereign of the universe affixed to his claim. It declared him to be all that he'd ever professed to be. And so it establishes the truth of all his teaching and the truth of the whole Christian society. The great fact that Jesus rose from the dead is the central fact of the evidence of Christianity. The gospel finds its center in the person and work of of Jesus and his death was necessary for our sins without the shedding of blood there's no remission but his resurrection showed that God accepted it it's not just a theological theory it is a historic reality according to the scriptures the physical bodily resurrection of Christ in which his the crucified body the very just to be clear the very self same crucified buried body was reanimated by the same spirit by God and rose again three days after this is the gospel believing these simple truths is what makes someone a Christian Jesus died for you it was an agnostic who became a believer and wrote some books his name was C.S. Lewis he said it this way. He said, The Christian story is precisely the story of one grand miracle. The Christian assertion that that is beyond all space and time. What is uncreated, eternal, came into nature, into human nature, and descended into its own universe, and rose again, bringing nature up with him. It is precisely one great miracle. If you take that away, there is nothing specifically Christian left. So there's not a neutral position. Either you believe the resurrection or you don't. Either Jesus rose and rightly demands your attention, your repentance, your trust and obedience, or he stayed dead. And if he has only became a rotting corpse, why should anyone follow him? The resurrection's part of the gospel. The next theme that we see in Romans is the second point that the resurrection accredits our salvation. I want you to go with me to chapter 4. Turn a few pages over there in Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, you'll see in verse, is, so he's talked about how there is this righteousness needed for one to be justified. We'll come to the end of chapter 4. It says, Speaking of Abraham, in verse 23, it says, But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered for, up for or because our transgression and raised for because of our justification. So this answers the question, how can a person become right with God? Which is one of the biggest questions we'll see in Romans. How can a sinner be right with God so as to escape eternal hell and enter into eternal heaven? And Romans told us earlier that there's none righteous, no, not one. But see, the currency of heaven is righteousness. Righteousness, goodness. But the Bible says there in Romans 3, there is none righteous, no, not one. There's none will be declared, there, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by observing the law. You can't obey the law. We could go through just the top 10, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, and almost, and, and almost every, not almost, every, everyone in this room, the guy in front of you as well, has broken them even today. Let's tick off a few. Thou shalt not steal. Have you ever stolen anything? Any little thing? cheated on a quiz, told someone else's answer. Thou shalt not lie. Maybe you just lied about the, whether you stole something or not. Um, <laughs> thou shalt not covet. Saw someone's car this morning, and I thought, ooh, I'd like to have that car. Um, one says not to covet your neighbor's wife and Jesus took it he says if you look on someone to someone who's not your spouse with lust in your heart you've committed adultery already in your heart and you say well hey I'm not that bad I haven't murdered anybody or anything like that 
thou shalt not kill, right? But then Jesus said, if you have hatred in your heart, in your heart, I say unto you, you've murdered in your heart. So right now, I am in a room full of a bunch of lying, thieving, adulterers at heart. We are all messed up. And I'm the first one in line. We do not have, in fact, if there was a bank account of righteousness, we're all not just zero with nothing to spend. We're overdrawn, and we have many, many millions of non-sufficient fund fees packed up on our account. God's solution in Romans 3 is that a righteousness from God apart from the law, something outside of us, something alien to us, he made known. This is the difference between Christianity and other religions. God makes a means available, and there's no other way around it. It is a righteousness that God requires, but it is also a righteousness that God provides. So here's the deal. How do you get this righteousness? And there's a lot of people think, well, I can earn it, right? No. The Bible says that all of our, all of our, our, even our best is as filthy rags. You don't get it through works of the law. You keep losing it. This is where Luther struggled with this, 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 this legal fact, and he came to the beginning of Romans, and he was wrestled with this. How do I get this? Because, uh, you know, I think I'm just getting infused by this and getting more of it through sacraments or whatnot, but, it, but it's still there inside of me. I'm just getting it there, but it's, it's leaking. I'm, I can't get it. I need somebody else's righteousness imputed or credited, a, like a legal term declared to be on my account. And this is where it says, and so it goes to, he goes to, Abraham, and he says how Abraham believed God and it was imputed or counted to him as righteousness. And he comes to this where he goes that Jesus was delivered up for our transgressions and raised for our justification. So this is this delivered up for, this is this idea from Isaiah 53 that he was bruised for our transgressions. He was, his, he was, he was, um, it says he carried our sorrows, his grief. Sickness, calamity, the effects of sin. He carried our sorrows, this inward effect of sin. We're sad. And right, right now you might be saying, Jason, this is a really sad story. I thought Easter was supposed to be encouraging. What do we do? We think we need some sympathizer, but what we need is a savior. And so, yes, it is healthy to focus on this because we're so neck deep in the self-esteem mumbo-jumbo, but the Bible would come and say, you are much worse than you thought you were. Too many think lightly of sin, Spurgeon said, and therefore think lightly of the Savior. So Jesus' work. And so when they looked on Jesus on the, on the cross, on Isaiah 53, it says, they esteemed him smitten, beaten to death, and afflicted smitten by God, wounded for our transgressions. He was pierced for our iniquities. Five times, the hymn writer says, I love it, five bleeding wounds he bears. They pour effectual prayers. They strongly plead for me, as Wesley wrote. Five bleeding wounds. Psalm 22, speaking hundreds of years before, but Jesus on the cross, he says, I'm poured out like water. My bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It's melted in the midst of my, my bowels. My strength is drained like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws. Thou hast brought me into the dust of death, for dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots for my vesture. But be not far from me, O Lord, my strength. Hasten to help me. Think, wow, that must have been written after Jesus' death. No, that was written hundreds of years before. Zechariah, I will pour out upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, and they shall look upon me, whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. Jesus was crushed, he was bruised, he took the chastisement upon it, he was scourged. With his stripes we are healed. And the Bible says in Isaiah that it was the will of God. God was pleased to do this so that he could redeem them, so that he could justify them. He is risen for our justification. This is not just a, 
theoretical thing. This is something that happens in salvation. Who was delivered for our offenses. Jesus died for you. He's risen again for our justification. In justification, it is the Father saying, it's, it's accepted. The payment is done. Here's the receipt. The payment is approved. Is that accredited? Do you have a certificate of that? Do you have a receipt of that? Do you have a license for that? And the resurrection is that. It is the ground of which Without it, we're still in our sins. Easter is the amen of God, the hallelujah of men. Um, his death showed us his willingness to save. His resurrection showed us his power to save us. Lloyd-Jones said it this way, if the Lord Jesus had not literally risen physically from the grave, we, he was a medical doctor, by the way, if the Lord Jesus had not literally risen physically from the grave, we would never be certain that he had ever really finished the work. If he has died for our sins, we must not only be certain that he has died, but that he has finished dying, and that there is no longer death. And when Jesus raised his son from the, when, when God raised his son from the dead, he was proclaiming to the whole world, he has done everything, he has fulfilled every demand, he is risen, therefore I am satisfied with him. He is risen for our justification. This is, and it brings about... So this resurrection assures our justification, but it also brings about something else. Look at the next first phrase of verse five of chapter five. Therefore, we have been justified by faith. And what are the benefits of this justification? We have peace with God. Do you have peace in your heart? Peace with God comes after this justification. Peace with God, access by faith, another benefit of salvation, hope another benefit of salvation of, of justification and joy in suffering all comes from this as a result of justification and the result is look at verse 11 of chapter 5 through whom we have be received reconciliation this justification brings about reconciliation you and I need to be reconciled to God. We're far from God. We're, we're, our sins have separated us from God. We're, we're, we're distant from Him. He doesn't, we need to be reconciled to Him. In verse 18, this justification that the resurrection, He's risen for our justification, says, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so by that righteous act leads to to justification and life for all. For by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. This is the good news. That, that the, the, it, sin is so serious, this, or quote Lloyd-Jones again, that either it needs to be paid for by a finite person for an infinite amount of time, or by an infinite person for a finite amount of time. That Jesus would die on the cross for our sins. Another theme uh, in this Romans road to the resurrection is in chapter 6. We've gone to chapter 5 now. In chapter 6, this brings about this union with Jesus. We often refer to this one when we have a baptism service. What shall we say then? Chapter 6, verse 1. Oh, we to continue to sin, my grace may abound. By no means. How can you, we who died to sin live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. I want you to notice the prepositions. You, you, with him, in him, with him, like him, united with him, like him, be united with him. This is, and then go over to chapter 7. In verse 4, it says, Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body, so that you belong one another to him who has been raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. So, so the resurrection is not just this justification at the beginning of the Christian life. The resurrection, then, number three, is related to the new life and growth as believers. So it's not just part of your justification. It's part of your sanctification, the Christianizing of the Christian, the growth of the Christian. It's, it, your union with Jesus is how you picture this new life and this death burial. It's what, that, that picture of that baptism that you're in union with him. And then it says in chapter 7 there, 
that, that part of this union here is for you to, that you may bear fruit for God. That your growth as a Christian is connected. Have you thought about that before? That the resurrection of Jesus is connected to how you are living your Christian life right now. And the power of it. Paul doesn't just say that here in Romans. He tells us that in a few other places. He says in Colossians, if you then have been risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Paul tells us um, that Christians have already been raised with Christ. We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death that we would be that we would be raised to walk in newness of life. And then in Ephesians he would say, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. So the resurrection is related to our growth. Here in chapter 7, go to chapter 8, point number 4 of this Romans resurrection road. Resurrection is the guarantee of our resurrection. Romans 8, verse 11. Romans 8, verse 11, where it says this. It says, If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. That your resurrection in the end is connected to the belief in the resurrection of Jesus. It's happened before, and He will promise this resurrection. And finally, with our time, I want you to go to chapter 10 of Romans, verses 9 and 10. So the resurrection... And the Romans road to the resurrection is part is crucial part of the gospel. It assures, it accredits it our salvation. It's part of our justification. Number three, it is related to our new life. It's part of our sanctification. It guarantees our future resurrection. It's part of our glorification. So the beginning, the middle, and the future of your salvation, the justification, sanctification, glorification are all connected in the resurrection. But I want you to see here, final or fifth point, that saving faith includes a sincere belief in the resurrection. This is where I want to hone in on, where it says here in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. It says, If we confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Someone said it this way. They said that a Christian is someone who believes in the physical resurrection of Jesus and lives in light of the implications of that event. Now that might seem like a very reduced definition, but based upon this text, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, it shows them. Now, yes, there are other things involved in believing in salvation than just the resurrection. But I would say that all of those things are deductions from the historicity of the resurrection. That the resurrection is part of the gospel that you need to believe. Without the resurrection, there is no good news at all. And so do you believe in the resurrection? So you say, well, what's the evidence? Okay. First line of evidence for the resurrection is that Jesus really did die. Jesus died. He's a physical body that died. And almost all scholar, scholars atheists and theists believe this. In fact, it's kind of like old news from like, you know, 19th century that to, to deny the physical death of Jesus. The Journal of American Medical Association published a peer-reviewed report saying that, quote, clearly the weight of the evidence indicates that Jesus was dead even before the wound in his side was inflicted. Even atheist scholars would say that it is indisputable that the man Jesus died. Another line of where evidence comes from what we would see in the early accounts of the resurrection. There are eyewitness reportings 
within months. We read there in, in 1 Corinthians, 500 eyewitnesses that see Jesus. We have records early, within months, both inside the Bible and outside the Bible, pointing to the resurrected Jesus. So the question is not, is, did Jesus die? Or did the Christians, but did he really? Is there is the empty tomb? And there is an empty tomb. Even the opponents admit that the tomb is empty. Um, we just have different explanations that explain how it got empty. Uh, Gary Habermas, who's really one of the experts on the resurrection, he, he goes like these, these basic components, and he'll give like six or up to 12 things that everybody has to explain. So the fact, you know, the old saying, you're entitled to your own opinion, but you're not your own set of facts. So there's a certain set of facts. One, that Jesus died by crucifixion. Two, he was buried. Jesus, and three, Jesus' death caused the disciples to despair and lose hope and believe that his life had ended. So even the disciples believe this. Four, Jesus was buried and discovered to be in a tomb that was discovered to be empty a few days later. Um, critical scholars all agree that. Five, the disciples had experiences that believe, that made them believe that Jesus had risen from the grave. Six, Jesus, the, these disciples became bold proclaimers of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Another point, seven, that the message of the resurrection was central to the early church. There's no one, no denying any honest historian that the resurrection was central to the teachings of the early church. There's no such, you have to wait till you get to like the 19th to 20th century before you get Christians, supposedly, that say you don't have to believe in the resurrection to be a Christian. This belief, number nine, the church is born and grows out of it. Ten, the Sunday becomes the primary day of worship for these followers. James, who had been a skeptic, was converted to faith because of what he said he saw the resurrected Jesus. A few years later, Paul, final, is converted by an experience in which he claims to see the risen Jesus. And so those 12 points you have to come up with an explanation for them. And we might differ on how we explain them, but you have to come up with it. And I would say that the best explanation for that is the belief in the bodily resurrection of Jesus. You, and one, one um, scholar said that when you've eliminated all the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. So when you take these away and you take these ideas that, well, it was just a myth. It was a, the, the resurrection myth. You know, there's this ancient, or ancient mythology in there, but, but, but we say, wait, but the Jews didn't believe in all those prophecies and things like this. Um, uh, someone, they, it's been demonstrated that it was only after the events of Christ that the story of the resurrection became popular amongst the Romans. It wasn't the other way around. Um, um, in 1 Corinthians, Paul defends the charge that Jesus did not rise. Few historians are found, believe that, that the church was founded that Jesus rose from the, the dead. So the church didn't create the resurrection stories. It was the resurrection stories that created the church. And then when someone says the other, the other explanation that used to be common was that well, the disciples lied. So the people that are hiding and denying him after his crucifixion are now going to lie about his resurrection. Almost all the disciples that believed on Jesus were almost all executed because of their refusal to deny that Jesus rose from the dead. Now, people often die for falsehoods that they genuinely believe, right? We've had this happen in this own country. Uh, we, we, people often die for falsehoods that they believe sincerely. But people don't tend to go to their death for a falsehood that they know to be false. It's something they made up. Spurgeon said it this way. He said, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is one of the best attested facts on record. Another myth is that, another idea is that people say, well, they, the disciples stole the body. It kind of fits in the same other one. 
the, at least this one has an original audience. Remember, the, they, they come and they say, oh, they, see, where have they taken you? We read this morning at the dock, uh, but where have they, the, the ladies are like, where have you taken our Lord? So nothing less than a revolution began on that very first Easter. So if these people, if, if, if the disciples or the authorities had the body, at some point they would have shown it. Um, and, and if you say, well, the disciples stole the body. Well, if these guys, if this elite group of soldiers was so careless that they're asleep, how do they miss this, these disciples coming and moving this thing and taking the thing away? And how do they know it was stolen if they were asleep? I mean, it just, it's like, how does this come about? Um, if it, and they say, well, the, the other one is that the authorities hid the body. And if it were possible to easily prove that Jesus was still dead, why didn't the Roman authorities show that? Another group of people say, well, they went to the wrong tomb. It's highly unlikely that the disciples and even Joseph of Arimathea, I mean, grave plots and tombs were not cheap then as they are not cheap now. You don't forget where it's at. You know, I bought this car and I forgot where I put it, you know. Um, if this was known, it would have been pointed out. It would have slowed the growth of the church, but it wasn't. And then there was the one who was maybe popular with, uh, years ago, the swoon theory, that Jesus swooned on the cross. But the Bible is emphatic that Jesus died. First, he underwent a sleepless night of trials and beatings that left him exhausted. He was scourged, a punishment so horrendous that many died just from the scourging. Jesus was crucified by a professional executioner who declared him to be dead. And to ensure that Jesus was dead, a spear was thrust through his side and a mixture of blood and water poured out of his side because the spear burnt, burst the heart. So if it's possible for someone to survive the beatings, the floggings, the crucifixion, the sleeplessness, and a spear in the heart, it doesn't make sense. And why did it take 18 centuries after Christ's death before someone came up with that idea? The final one is that the disciples saw hallucinations. Well, medical professionals tell us that it is extremely rare for any hallucination to be shared by more than one person, much less over 500. This is completely inconsistent with the results of hallucinations as described in any medical textbook. So whatever the explanations we offer for the events of the Gospels and the Acts, they must explain both the empty tomb and the appearances. But we can go even outside the Bible and go to Pliny in AD 112, writing about Christians in his area. And he says they, speaking of these Christians, were in the habit of meeting on a certain fixed day before it was light, Sunday, when they sang in alternating verses a hymn to Christ as to a God. They bound themselves to a solemn oath not to do any wicked deeds, but to never commit a fraud, theft, or adultery, never to falsify their word or deny a truth. And they would be called upon to deliver it up, after which was their custom to separate and then reassemble to partake of food, but food for an ordinary and innocent kind. Basically, he's describing what Christians did on a Sunday morning. That they sang hymns to Christ as to God. A letter to Justin Martyr to the emperor in AD 150, claiming that at the time the emperor could find information about the birth of Jesus from the records of a census and his life miracles rising from the dead and reports of his own resurrection from official reports filed by Pilate. There's so much more. We could just go, there's evidence upon evidence upon evidence. At no point in her church history has there been a widespread debate among Christian theologians about the resurrection of Jesus. The historic evidences which prove the resurrection are obvious for all to see. So why don't people believe it? Because their heart doesn't want to believe. The reason that men do not see it's because our, it's not because they, they, they're not smart. It's because sin blinds us. Faith is not a blind leap in the dark without evidence. But this is when the Holy Spirit comes and opens our eyes to the truth that's been there before us all along. The resurrection is involved in all our justification, our sanctification, and our glorification. 
Um, I know it's, it's, it's um, years ago, I went to, the, to get my driving test. And when I went to get my driving test, so excited about this, um, ready to go. I'd driven four-wheelers, tractors, lawnmowers. I was ready, right? Even took the old Subaru from my family out in the field behind the house and practice. And uh, when I went to the driving test, there was something on the test that I wasn't expecting. It was a vision test. <laughs> and I found out I needed to wear contacts and glasses, corrective lenses, right? So before, I'd just been aiming the lawnmower, <laughs> right? Uh, and and this probably also explained my batting average in Little League. Um, but there were some glimpses from before to that, but when I started wearing glasses and contacts, all of a sudden I could see all these things. It wasn't that I didn't know there and wasn't capable of things. It was just it wasn't clear. And there may be someone here who's like, you know, you, you've kind of had this idea of like, hey, there's this fuzziness that Jesus rose from the dead. But at some point, the Bible comes and the Holy Spirit puts the lights on and illumines and lets us see this biblical worldview that this is for you. And there may be some folks in this room today that the Holy Spirit is saying, is like, Jesus rose. I need to believe this. And this is what the gospel is. So the resurrection is crucial to the gospel. It accredits our salvation. It affects our new life. It guarantees our future resur resurrection. And, it, and saving faith requires us to believe in it. And so let me read that verse again. If you are not a believer, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. How do you get saved? This is conversion, repenting your sins, believing on Jesus. Repent and believe the gospel. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Repent, believe, understand that the means of salvation, they are practical and they are weighty. Lack of faith condemns us to hell. He that believeth is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already. Where, how do we believe? The object of the faith determines the value of the faith. It's believing on Jesus, and we believe with our heart Confess with our mouth, believe in our heart, the heart that God raised him from the dead. It's our head, it's our emotions, and our will. He invites us to come to Christ and believe it on him. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Just in the quietness. Maybe you're here and you don't know Christ. Would you, right now, cry out in your heart to God, confess your sin, and believe on Jesus? In your own words, cry out.